Well, today we're going to take a look at the ratio test. And in some cases, you can run this ratio test on a series and determine whether the series converges or diverges. It really depends on how the ratio test comes out. Um, and we're always going to compare to one. If the ratio test comes out larger than one, you have a divergent series. If the ratio test comes out less than one, um, which won't be negative because this is a, a ratio of absolute values. So if your ratio test comes out somewhere between zero and one, but strictly less than one, then you have a series that converges. Sometimes the ratio test comes out equal to one, which is disappointing because it takes a lot of work and uh, you cannot reach a conclusion. We'll uh, encounter each one of these uh, possibilities today in our work. But um, on this first example, we have a series of all positive numbers and it's an infinite series. And so I've got some partial sums of it written down. The first partial sum is where you just have the first term. Of course, this value is 0.5. The second partial uh, sum is where you add the first two terms together and you get 0.75. This is the third partial sum or the value of it. It's a half plus a fourth plus a 10. And I bring this up because when you're adding up a series of all positive numbers and that series is infinite, has an infinite number of terms, then, first of all, your partial sum sequence will always be increasing because every time you add on a new term, it's positive. And so you have to have a partial sum that's bigger than the previous one. S4 is bigger than S3. And this should say S5. And it's bigger than S4. S6 is bigger than S5, etc. And this is uh, true throughout. So. So now the question is, if the sequence of partial sums is increasing, does it increase to infinity? Or is it bounded? If it's bounded by any number, then it must have an, at least upper bounds, and that means that the series uh, converges to a limit. So one way to tell if a, if a series is bounded is something called the comparison test. Now this video is not about the comparison test, but it's related to it. In fact, the ratio test really is uh, just sort of a special case of the comparison test where you have a series that is not necessarily geometric, but you compare your series to a geometric series. So I'm gonna do that right now. I'm gonna write down a geometric series G and uh, its first term is one and its second term is one third, and its third term is one ninth, and its fourth term is one twenty seventh. And you, I think, can tell that it is geometric because um, each term divided by the previous term makes one third. Or another way to think of that is I can multiply, for example, one over eighty one times one third, and I get the next term, which is one over two hundred and forty three. Now this is an infinite series and it's uh, geometric and its common ratio is one third. Because its ratio is close enough to zero, we can compute the value of this series. And that is the first term, one, divided by one minus the common ratio, one third, which turns out to be one over two thirds, which turns out to be three halves or 1.5. Well, the reason we do this is because <clears throat> even though this series S is not geometric, you can see each one of its terms is related to the term up here in G. A fourth, for example, has got a denominator just one larger than three, and a tenth has a, de a divisor just one larger than nine. Well, this again is not geometric, but each of its terms is uh, smaller than the corresponding term in the in the series G. So 128 is smaller than 127th. 1 over 82 is smaller than 1 over 81. And by that comparison, S has to add up to something smaller than G. So S is bounded. S has to add up to something smaller than 1.5. And so that's a bound. And it really doesn't matter what the bound is if you know that your series of all positive numbers is bounded, then it will converge to some limit. Okay, 
Now, that's really what the ratio test would tell us about this series S. To run the ratio test, you're going to need to know the nth term and the n plus first term, or formulas for those. So if this is the nth term, the n plus first, the next term down, uh, down the line is going to be 1 over 3 to the n plus 1 plus 1 in a divisor. They look very, very similar. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a ratio of these and we're going to take the limit of that ratio as n goes to infinity. And I think I'll work that up here where I've got lots of space. So it's limit as n goes to infinity of the n plus first term over the nth term. And I'm going to be lazy with the absolute values here because there's nothing negative in this series S. And so that's the limit as n goes to infinity. And the n plus first term was 1 over 3 to the n plus 1 plus 1. And the nth term was 1 over 3 to the n plus 1. Like that. Now, I'm taking a limit of the ratio of ratios. I can divide by this um, t sub n term by, you know, inverting it and multiplying it. And, of course, that's going to look like this. The limit as n goes to infinity of 3 to the n plus 1 over 3 to the n plus 1 plus 1. So notice that this one ended up in the numerator. And this one is still down here as a divisor. Well, I'm not going to get too uh, preachy on this, but you know, if you applied L'Hopital's rule to this, which you should because you have an infinity over infinity form, you would end up with something like this. The limit as n goes to infinity. Uh, the derivative up here is natural log 3 times 3 to the n. And the derivative down here is natural log 3 times 3 to the n plus 1. Of course, the natural logs cancel. Uh, you have one more factor of 3 down here than you do up there. So cancel these, subtract these exponents, and you end up with a limit as n goes to infinity of 3 to the negative 1 power, which of course is a constant, and so the answer is just 1 third. All right, that is less than 1. And the ratio test tells us that even though we didn't have a geometric series, in the end, when you get way down the line with this series S, and you're dividing these uh, consecutive terms, this one by this one, this one by this one, this one by this one, in the end, those ratios stabilize to one-third, which means you could design a geometric series that begins with a, a, a larger first term and then either uses the same ratio here or you could even use a larger ratio. Like instead of one-third, you could use two-thirds and you could establish an upper bound for this non-geometric series. So that's what's behind the ratio test. And what about when the ratio test is not less than one? Well, I'm going to do two quick examples here. Here's this famous uh, harmonic series. Uh, 1 plus a half plus a third plus a fourth and so forth. Uh, what's the nth term here? It's 1 over n. And what's the n plus first term? It's 1 over n plus 1. So if I take the limit as n goes to infinity of the ratio of the n plus first term and the nth term, I'm taking the limit as n goes to infinity of this divided by that. Well, when I divide this by that, that looks like 1 over n plus 1 over 1 over n. Uh, I'm going to divide by 1 over n by inverting it. So that's 1 over n plus 1 times n over 1 which just makes n over n plus 1. Okay, and it should be pretty clear that even though this is a, an infinity over an infinity form, applying L'Hopital's rule, these would both have derivatives of 1, so now you're taking the limit as n goes to infinity of the constant 1, and the answer is 1. So that can be bad news when you're running a ratio test because 
if the ratio test comes out equal to 1, you can't make a conclusion. In other words, running the ratio test and getting this, uh, this 1 here doesn't tell you whether this thing is bounded and converges or whether this thing uh, has, uh, you know, an infinite amount of uh, value to it. Well, you, you may know this one. It turns out the harmonic series adds up to infinity, and we're not here to explain that today. Other series, which also have a ratio test uh, that equals 1, actually converge. And here's a famous example of one. It's 1 plus 1 fourth plus 1 ninth plus 1 sixteenth plus, of course, 1 over 25. What are we doing here? We're adding up the uh, reciprocals of the squares. So the nth term is 1 over n squared. And n plus first term is 1 over n plus 1 squared. Now let's apply the ratio test to this. So we have limit as n goes to infinity, n plus first term over nth term. And when it's appropriate today, we will put the absolute values on there. But let's see, we did something like this just a minute ago where we divided this by this and we had to flip this one over. So I won't show you all those steps, but it ends up looking something like this. Uh, this one with a divisor of n plus 1 squared will still be a divisor even after I divide these two. But this one with a divisor of n squared, that n squared will go to the top and end up up here like this. And so then you take the limit as n goes to infinity of n over n plus 1, and you let the limit go inside of that continuous square function. And you again get an answer of 1 just like you did with the last problem. Well, now, what does that mean about this series? It means nothing. You can't now tell from this whether this series increases without bound and goes to infinity like this one does, or whether this adds up to some bounded limit. It turns out this is a bounded series, a very famous one, and uh, Thanks to Leonard Euler, we actually know that it adds up to pi squared over 6, which we're not here to explain either. <laughs> okay, uh, you may have encountered what are called P-series already, too. This is the, the index of the term. If I start counting with 1, first term, second term, third term, fourth term, fifth term, this is the index 2 squared. This is the index 3 squared, index 4 squared. And so, since I'm squaring, I'm using an exponent of 2. This is called a P equals 2 series. And uh, when you study P series, you'll be able to tell at a glance that this converges. But it won't give you this answer. It'll just tell you it's a P equals 2 series and it converges. All right, here's a, here's a series S. We're going to run the ratio test on it. And uh, here's the nth term. Why is that the nth term? Well, you know, you're dividing by 3, 5, 7, 9. Those are moving by 2. So that's why I have to have 2 in here. And if I consider this the 0th term, let's put the indices here. 0, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th term, etc. Just stop here at where n equals 4. Multiply 2 times 4 plus 1. You get both the 9 that's in the divisor and you get the 9 that's in the exponent. So that's what now. That helps you write the n plus first term, which you know has to be two larger. Because if it's going to go, five, divisors are going to be 3, 5, 7, 9. They're moving by 2. So whatever you put here for the n plus first term, this has to be 2 larger than 2n plus 1. So that's 2n plus 3. And then times 4 fifths to the 2n plus 3 power. Okay, this one gets kind of messy, so I just went ahead and typed it out so I could make the video go a little bit faster. Here it is. Take a look. The limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of these two consecutive terms, way, way down the list somewhere, because n is going to infinity. The newer term divided by the previous term, the older term. Here's the setup. 
Notice that when you divide this by that, you get 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 3. And then I broke this up into a product of limits, where in the second limit I'm dividing these powers of 4 fifths. And then 2n plus 3, see these are powers that have the same base. 2n plus 3 minus 2n plus 1 is just 2, so I'm left with this limit. Okay, run L'Hopital's rule on this, and you'll end up getting the limit as n goes to infinity of 2 over 2. So this one's the limit as n goes to infinity of 2 over 2. And that's the limit of a constant. Of course, this one's the limit of a constant also. So you end up with 1 for this limit times 4 fifths squared for that limit. And that is 1620 fifths. Now that's not what this adds up to. This is just the ratio test. This is just a test. It's supposed to help us decide whether or not this thing um, has a it adds up to infinity, whether it's unbounded, or whether it converges to some finite limit. And this is telling me because uh, we got a ratio test answer less than 1, that this thing's going to converge. Now, remember, this is related to the comparison test. So you could make, uh, you could make a geometric series and you could show that this thing is bounded by just picking a term that's a little bit larger than this. So let's start with one. And uh, let's pick out uh, a common ratio that's just a little bit larger than what the ratio test gave us. 16 over 25 is 0.64. So I'll go with a bigger ratio of 0.8. And I'll go with 0.8 times 1. And then I'll go with 0.8 squared times 1. And I'll go with 0.8 cubed oops, times 1. And so I'm making this geometric uh, series. Well, this term is larger than this one. This term is larger than this one, as I will demonstrate. This term is larger than this one. And uh, so that means s has to add up to something smaller than g. Well, g is geometric, and its ratio is 0.8, and so it adds up to its first term divided by 1 minus its common ratio. And that turns out to be 1 over 0.2, which adds up to 5. 5 is a bound for this series, because this series has to add something smaller than g. Now, we don't do this every time we run the ratio test, but that's what's going on in the background, and that's the last time you'll see that today. One of the things ratio test commonly gets used for is to um, find the interval of convergence for a, a Taylor polynomial. So here's Taylor polynomial for uh, natural log, and uh, it turns out that this Taylor polynomial has an open interval of convergence of 0 is less than x is less than 2. Later we'll find out that that 2 is actually included in the complete interval of convergence. But the number 1.5 certainly is between 0 and 2. And so you can plug 1.5 into this polynomial and uh, get an approximation for the natural log of 1.5. This is a series, now it alternates from plus to minus to plus to minus, but it's a, it's a way to approximate the natural log of 1.5. Well, does it converge? Here we've run the ratio test on it. Okay, this is the expression for the nth term, which I think you can see pretty clearly. Start counting with um, n equals 1. Call this the second term, the third term, and the fourth term, etc. And in each term, you have 1 over n, and you also have 0.5 to the nth power. So that's the nth term. That's the n plus first term. Um, because of the absolute values, I didn't put any of these minus signs in there like I might have um, seen back here. The ratio test just deals with positive things. It makes it easy. But anyway, so I divide this by that. I subtract the exponents of these two powers, n plus 1 minus n makes 1. I break this up into two limits. 
This limit we've seen a couple times a day. It's equal to 1. This is the limit of a constant. And so you get 0.5. The ratio test applied to this natural log polynomial with 1.5 plugged into it. So this is what I've done is plug 1.5 in everywhere you see an X. And I got this series and I run the ratio test on it and the answer came out smaller than 1. So now we know this series converges. But we're not done with the natural log yet. Next, we're going to take a look at why it is that you can use anything between 0 and 2 in that natural log polynomial and why if you use something larger than 2 uh, you'll get divergence. Okay so here are just some fun graphs for the Taylor polynomial for natural log. I made this one to be 21st degree so it's got 21 terms and um, here's the 22nd degree and you'll notice that in both cases they do a great job of uh, matching the natural log graph, and then they just fly off and run away. And that's because you can't use this polynomial with numbers two or larger. You can't put numbers zero or smaller in it either. But so, um, again, I've done a lot of the work on this in advance to make the video go faster. Um, here is the nth term, and here is the n plus first term. And I've dropped all the negative 1 powers off of there because we're running absolute values. And again, I broke this up into a product of two limits. One where I divided these, and I got n over n plus 1. And one where I divided these. Well, these are powers of the same base. You can subtract the exponents to get x minus 1 to the first power, which is just x minus 1. Okay, well, what's this limit again? It's 1. And what is this limit? Well, there are no n's in here. This limit is not affected by n. So as far as n is concerned, these guys are constants. So you get 1 times absolute value of x minus 1. Now, did the ratio test come out smaller than 1, bigger than 1, or equal to 1? That's up to us to determine. What we want to do is take the result of the ratio test, in this case, which is an expression, and we want to write that that needs to be less than 1. Well, of course, if the absolute value of x minus 1 is less than 1, it's because the contents of this absolute value are close enough to 0. They are between negative 1 and 1. So now I know negative 1 is less than x minus 1 is less than 1. And now I know that if I add 1 here and here and here, I'll get add 1 here and here and here I'll get 0 is less than x is less than 2 that's the open interval of the Taylor polynomial for the natural log and it's beyond today's uh, the scope of today's topic to explain why the two can be included for the so-called complete interval of convergence all right just a few more examples here find the open interval of convergence for each Taylor polynomial well I, I, I can tell by the sigma notation what the nth term looks like it looks like 1 well, let's go x minus 4 to the nth power over n and I'm going to need to know the n plus first term too so that would be x minus uh, 4 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. Now, I want to show you a very, very nice shortcut where you can avoid writing out all these tedious steps like some of these ones I've typed here today and see if this makes sense. Uh, each one of these terms, tn and tn plus 1, are really composed out of, of two things, a numerator and a denominator a numerator and a denominator and that's it and the denominator has just one factor and the numerator has well just one power keeping that in mind I'm going to run the uh, the test here with the n plus first term on top of the nth term and absolute values but I'm just going to skip into this several steps this is an efficient way to do this I'm going to write for this problem two limits both of these are going to look like fractions. 
And the second limit is going to be a fraction with absolute values. And remember this. All terms or factors that involve x go here. All factors or divisors that don't have x go here. And because you have t sub n plus 1 here over t sub n, the numerator here will preserve its orientation of this stays on top and this goes on the bottom. But you're dividing by tn, and when you divide by tn, you have to take the reciprocal of this. So both of these will end up opposite this fraction bar. The n will be on top, and the x minus 4 to the nth will be on the bottom. That's my approach to how to load this thing up. So again, x's go here, and this stays on top. That's how I start. n plus 1 doesn't have any x's in it. It should stay on the bottom because it's part of this term that was up here. Put it over here. Now, both parts of this fraction will go here and here. And uh, this needs to go to the bottom again because you're dividing by the reciprocal of this. And it's got x involved, so you should put it over here. This needs to go to the top. And of course, that's the only space left. Now, we just saved ourselves a lot of writing. And I'm going to use this efficient method for the rest of these problems. So, this, the limit, it then goes to infinity of n over n plus 1. We'll talk about that in just a minute. On this one, you're dividing two terms, or excuse me, two powers. They have the same base, so you subtract the exponents. n plus 1 minus n is just 1. So I have the following. Limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of x minus 4 to the first power. Now, what's this limit? Several times a day we've seen this, and the answer is 1. What's this limit? It's not affected by n. It's just the absolute value of x minus 4. And so our ratio test ended with an expression. We can't tell if this is bigger than 1 or smaller than 1 or equal to 1. We just don't know. But we can require it to be less than 1. And you saw this in the last problem. If the absolute value of x minus 4 is less than 1, then our series, excuse me, our polynomial will converge. And this will reveal the type of x's that you can put into this polynomial and expect convergence. Absolute value of x minus 4 is less than 1 means negative 1 is less than x minus 4 is less than 1. Now add 1 here and here and here. Or excuse me, not 1. Add, let's add 4 here, here, and here. And what we'll get is x trapped between a 5 and a 3. And that is your open interval of convergence for this Taylor polynomial. All right, this next one is kind of famous. <clears throat> if you write it out, I think you'll recognize it. So if n equals 0, I have x to the 0 over 0 factorial. That's just 1. If n equals 1, I have x to the first over 1 factorial. That's just x. When n equals 2, I have x squared over 2 factorial. That looks like this. And the next one is 1 over 3 factorial. x cubed. Do you recognize this? Of course you do. This is the Taylor polynomial for e to the x. I expanded around x equals 0, so it's also a Maclaurin polynomial. But anyway, we want to run the ratio test on this, and something interesting happens. The nth term looks like this. It's x to the n over n factorial. And the n plus first term looks like this. x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. So I'm going to use that efficient method, and I'm going to take the limit as n goes to infinity. And um, I'm going to have two limits, actually. Sometimes you need three limits. But both these limits are limits of ratios. And the second one has absolute values on it. But the first one does not. And the second one is where you want to put all factors or divisors of x. So let's start with the new uh, t sub n plus 1. Remember, this one's not supposed to flip over. So you put its x power here. And you put its factorial down here. This is the one that's uh, inverted in the ratio test, because you're dividing by tn, t sub n. 
So we want to uh, move x to the nth power to the bottom, and we should put it here. And we want to put n factorial up here. That's how I start this one. It saves you a lot of writing, a lot of steps. Okay, n factorial divided by n plus 1 factorial. Well, gee, if you haven't seen that before, let me give you a quick lesson. n factorial is 1 times 2 times 3 up to n. n plus 1 factorial is 1 times 2 times 3 up to n plus 1. But right before n plus 1 was n. So you're going to get all kinds of factor cancellation here. 1's cancel, 2's cancel, 3's cancel, n's cancel. But this one doesn't. So all you're left with here is a limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n plus 1. And on this one, you are dividing two powers that have the same base. Of course, so you subtract the exponents. n plus 1 minus n is 1. So this is limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of x to the first. Well, this is not affected by n going to infinity. So here I have absolute value of x. This limit, I hope you recognize, is 1 over infinity. That is 0. Now, it doesn't matter what x is. Take its absolute value, multiply it by 0, it's going to come out to 0, which for any x is less than 1. What does this mean? It means it doesn't matter what x you plug into this polynomial. It could be very large, in fact. This polynomial, evaluated at your favorite x value, is going to converge because the ratio test comes out to 0. So when you run a ratio test, which is often the case when you see factorials down here, the ratio test often comes out to zero, and that's telling you the interval of convergence for the Taylor polynomial for e to the x is this. Negative infinity is less than x is less than infinity. All right. Whew, long video. We can do one more, can't we? Now, this one's pretty complicated. Disregarding the power of negative 1, because remember, in the ratio test, we're going to do something like this. Limit as n goes to infinity, and we're going to do absolute value of the n plus first term divided by the nth term. And that's why when I run a ratio test, I don't worry about powers of negative 1. I just want to know what the nth term looks like in absolute value. So think about this. What's the absolute value of the nth term? And that's x minus 6 to the nth power over n times 2 to the nth. What's the n plus first term look like in absolute value? Well, that's x minus 6 to the n plus 1. And down here it's n plus 1. And then also times 2 to the n plus 1. Well, I'm going to run a ratio test, which looks like this, and I'm going to put down three limits this time. Why three limits? Because each one of these has got two divisors and one uh, power up here in the numerator. That's like three components. So I'm going to have a limit times a limit times a limit. And each one of these limits is going to have a ratio. And the last limit is where I'm going to have the ratio with the absolute value around it. This doesn't have to be done this way. This is just the way I like to do it. Okay, this is very efficient if you do it right. Make sure that the n plus 1, the n plus first term, uh, anything that was in the numerator stays there. Anything that was a divisor remains a divisor as you spread these things out across this pattern. Keep the power of x here inside the limit. So I'm going to put that here. Then I'm going to put each of these in either of these two locations down here. And then I do the same thing with these, except they all get inverted. The numerator goes to the denominator, and the uh, two divisors become uh, new numerators in their respective fractions. And I can see I've already forgot the n plus 1 here. <laughs> okay. Quickly, I have this limit that I'll deal with in a minute. I think you already know the answer to it. Limit as n goes to infinity of n over n plus 1. 
And uh, then I have this limit where I'm dividing two powers of two. Well, there's more factors of two on the bottom, just one more. So you end up with limit as n goes to infinity of either one half or two to the negative one power, your choice. And then finally over here, dividing these powers of x minus six, I have n plus one here and n there. I subtract these exponents to get just a first power. So this is limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of x minus 6 to the first power. Now, what's this limit? That's 1. What's this limit? That's the limit of a constant. What's this limit? Not affected by n. So this is just the absolute value of x minus 6. Now we want to guarantee that this comes out to be less than 1. Right, because we're looking for x's that make our original polynomial converge. So now we have the job of solving one half absolute value x minus six is less than one. Let's go ahead and multiply both sides by two to get x minus six absolute value is less than two. That means x minus six is somewhere between two and negative two. That's how close to zero it has. So you're going to solve this negative two is less than x minus 6 is less than 2 and finally add 6 here and here and here add 6 and you'll get 4 is less than x is less than 8 and that is your open interval of convergence for this Taylor polynomial up here that's enough for today 36 minutes into this hope you enjoyed this my name's Eric. Have a nice day.